Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator, and I'm here with Todd. Of Todd Cutler. Of Todd Cutler. So, what is Todd Cutler? Uh, right, Todd Cutler has got a very simple um, message, really, and that is just to deliver good, high quality, historically accurate, um, but well pr priced knives. So, um, whereas a, a Todd's workshop knife, custom made, it will cost you somewhere between three and four hundred pounds generally. Uh, the Todd Cutler stuff I'm trying to get in at around about um, 60 to 80 pounds, 60 to 85 pounds, something like that. But for historically accurate, well-made knives. So, yeah. I mean, this one I think you had a look at before. So it's uh, English Rondel from around about 1420-ish. Um, so you've got a, a twisted barley corn grip, some nice organic spacers here, and some brass plates, which is quite a typical way of mm. constructing them. It's very nicely proportioned, and it's... Yeah. it's uh, it's a sort of what I'd describe as a, a combination cut and thrust blade in that it's yeah. got, you know, it's not a cutting blade, it is a stabbing blade, but it's got an edge on it, should yeah. you need one. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that blade is, uh, what, 8 mil thick, so I mm. don't know what that is in Imperial, sorry. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, significantly over a quarter of an inch. So it's, mm. you know, they're, they're nicely historically proportioned, you know. And that's mm. a good, typical sort of 15th century, late 14th to 15th century style. Uh, yeah, Rundle, uh, and very much sort of knight's type type yeah. weapon, uh, a run the day knight. Nobody, nobody too fancy, nobody too special. Yeah, um, and then yeah, just sort of followed it up with uh, things like a quill and dagger here. Which, if you look at the artwork, actually, interestingly, um, this sort of dagger form, more or less stylistically like this, runs from around about twelve hundred really through until about seventeen hundred. You know, mm. for simply made things. Mm. Um, so again, it's core bound grip on that nice double edged blade. I'd also say that this is, to a certain extent, a sort of neglected dagger um, style in, in modern, um, certainly in HEMA it doesn't get an awful lot of attention. Most of the HEMA sources that deal with dagger combat are either showing rondel daggers or very occasionally bollock uh, daggers, which we'll look at in a second. Um, but as Todd says, quillon daggers were actually around, or often called quillon daggers because they've got quillons. Um, they weren't called that in period, incidentally, yes. um, were around like right the way through and essentially becomes the left hand dagger with a rapier, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's all, you know, in the 17th century, they were still using these. Not all of those left hand daggers have any side rings or some mm. of them are just simple like that. So something like this would be completely legitimate, as you say, from the 13th century right the way yeah. through to the 17th century, uh, and even you could say even into the naval that it, it, it almost evolved into in the 18th century. Well, it is funny how how long some things run. So there's a, um, a mace head that I sell, um, but there was still issued, a bronze mace head, it was still issued to the, the French at the end of the uh, 19th century. Right. But the pattern goes all the way back to like 12th, 13th century. Yeah. So, so one, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You know, one style of mace head mm. ran for 600 years, you know, which is... It's not normal, that's not normal, but in some things it does happen. And to my mind, you know, when you have something that stays around, a very similar design that stays around for a very long time, it's just because it, it works. Yeah. Uh, and very clearly, you know, you look at that dagger, actually, if you just look at the, the blade and the cross guard for a minute, think World War II Commando Fairbairn Sykes. Yeah. It's, it's almost an identical blade, isn't well, it? Do you, know, do you know the truth of that? Because what I heard was when they wanted a fighting knife, they went to, I think it was the V&A, actually, and they looked at fighting knives of the time, and he said, we'll basically copy that one. Is that true? Um, it rings a bell, but I'm not going to say... Uh, that, that's <laughs> maybe something for another video, because yeah. I'm not entirely sure. And I know that he himself wasn't that happy with the dagger as it eventually came out. And he later came out with different models of, yeah. of knife and dagger. But anyway, um, but yeah, but so this, this itself is probably quite typical of 14th century, I yes. guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, but as you say, we, see, we do see quill and daggers like this in uh, the Makiowski Bible, I can mm. never pronounce that very well, which is from about 1250, I think. Mm, so like. uh, that's one of the main sources where we actually see quite a lot of these sort of mm. daggers start to appear. And it's very clear, at least, well, I won't say it's clear, but to me, I have a strong suspicion that there's a relationship between the appearance of daggers, specifically used by men at arms or knights, and the appearance of heavier armour, particularly plate used in conjunction with uh, mail. So in 1250, we know that lots of knights were starting to wear what's called a coat of plates, that is um, overlapping um, plates attached either on the inside or outside of a fabric garment underneath their surcoat. So you often can't see it in the period artwork. Now clearly if your opponents are getting more and more heavily, heavily armoured, um, then just your sword and shield combo 
it, you might need something for closer in because you're not taking the mouse at range anymore. Yeah. You're having to get in really close and, and you know get this into places to finish them off. That's also sometimes known as a misericord in 19th century mm. sources, and I've never really been sure of why they sometimes uh, call it that. <coughs> right, okay, so so the Quillon dagger, which covers quite a large period of time, very nice example. It's very ergonomic, I've got to say, peened. Yes, uh, peened construction. All, all yeah. peened, so all traditionally made, and this is um, leather over cord, exactly like a sword grip. Yes, yeah. yes it is, uh, and then with a co uh, cord pattern pressed in. Mm. Um, but again, what going back to the historical accuracy mm. side reenactment daggers very often you'll end up with like a six inch grip or something like yeah. that because it will fit everybody you know but actually of course it ends up fitting nobody i and hate oversized yeah, grips exactly. they're horrible and actually i i almost want the the pommel to be snuggling the bottom of my hand there so mm. i won't say it's it's not like a, a viking period sword it's a different type of thing for that but I want to be able to feel the pommel. I don't want the pommel to be miles away from it, my hand. It's part of the grip. It's yeah. part of knowing where your weapon is in your hand and, and the edge access, of line. And, and yeah, accessing it, getting it out. And, and um, yeah, it's a very, very pretty little thing. And also uh, worth mentioning that sometimes these Quillon daggers were made as a set with their swords. So everybody knows that mm. sometimes daggers and rapiers were made to match. But that's even if we look at the effigies in the 14th century, you can sometimes see them wearing a dagger that has stylistic features which match those on the sword. Yeah. And they've got matching scabbards mm. and the belt and it's all made as a set, isn't it? Mm. Mm. So yeah, really nice. And that could be carried by pretty much any social class, although more yeah, slightly Yeah, I mean, upper, again, it? it's military. The way, the way I view it more yeah. is that the higher up you are militarily in, in the class, mm. the more likely you are to have a military dagger. I mm. mean, you could end up with something like that as a, an archer, but it's probably yeah. something that you've picked up off the field, won it in a deck, yeah. bought it because he had a good day, whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's not what you would have turned up with on day one. No, it's a lovely, lovely little thing anyway, really mm. nice. Right. Um, I think you'll grab that. Um, it's another rondel, sort of quite typically 15th century, really. Um, again, nice stout blade, bit of a reinforced tip on it. Uh, hollow rondels, because again, to get it histor historically accurate, they look like they're solid. Mm. But they're not, because then you'd end up with something that's like a club, you know, and it's not what they were like. So, and a lot of a lot of make, modern makers do they just see a picture of the thing and make it solid, and it ends up handling nothing like the original because they are solid. Absolutely. So those are beaten out of sheet, brazed, cleaned up, um, and then on a relatively delicate handle. Mm. Um, but again, faceted so that you've got some idea of where your hand is. You know. There's also a hint at the architecture of the day there, isn't it? It gives it a sort of gothic look, I think, uh, uh, mm. of the, the sort of, what is it, an octagon or... Yeah, yeah okay. so, um, but, uh, but yeah, so the, the blade is beveled at the back. We could ask why. <laughs> I think it's probably weight reduction, isn't it? Because the, the, they've still, see, by keeping the mass up here, you, you still have a, like you say, a reinforced mm. tip. But by taking material off the back here, you are making the blade lighter while still keeping a good blade thickness for the rigidity. You are. I think we'll never know the answer to, mm. to that, really. It could just um, be because it looks cool. It could be because it looks yeah. cool. There's, there's, a very, there's a lovely dagger in uh, Lee's Armouries, which has got a whole series of flat and then cut out and then flat and then cut yeah. out all along the back edge. No purpose whatsoever. Well, it's you know? just like Bowie knives from the 19th yeah. century that have the decorative firework. Just looks yeah. funky. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And you've got to remember, you ne never underestimate, particularly in the medieval period, I think, because compared to later periods, medieval weapons can look more simple. So a lot of people just think about them in terms of function, when actually appearance is just as important to mm. someone, you know, uh, in, in the medieval period as it was in any other century. Yeah, no, know? absolutely. Um, and again, their aesthetic is different to ours. So they liked bright, gaudy colours, um, and, but the, the Gothic architecture of the time, there was a certain proportion and shape and line that they clearly liked. It clearly mm. wasn't all about function. It was sometimes about uh, what the thing looked like. Very often it's about show. Mm. You know, it's you wear your money, you wear your goods, you, you're displaying to the world mm. how cool you are. Mm. And, and you can't do that unless everything you own is groovy. Yeah. You know? And, and similarly, it's about, this is a status symbol as well, the rondel dagger particularly, I would say probably the quillon dagger as well actually, are particularly status symbols in mm. that this is the weapon, this is the dagger of a knight. Yeah. So in many scenarios, certainly in the 14th, 15th century, actually they wouldn't wear swords around in, you know, in civilian environments, but they would wear a dagger. Yeah. 
And so, because they're not wearing their sword, they want their dagger to talk about them. Yeah. And, and so they want to wear their, the knight's dagger because they want to show people that they are a knight, or at least a mounted, the equivalent of a knight. Or they, or they want to be known as. Yeah, or they want people yeah. to, yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, this weapon speak by wearing it, this, this tells everybody that sees it something about you. And also, sometimes, um, it can be, I suppose, a degree of... Um, trying to inspire some degree of awe in, in people. I am a fighting person. I'm not just, you know, this isn't a showy, yeah. you know, it, it, this, is, this is a weapon. This is a weapon that's been on campaign or could go on campaign or it could be used in a, a duel yeah. to settle a map of that, That's very true. I'm, I'm wearing it, not just because I want to look hard, because yeah. I really know how to use it. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. You know? um, and when we look at the treatises that show uh, dagger fighting, it's the rondel dagger. That's mm. because it's tied in with this this mindset of the the warrior elite. You know, it's the European equivalent of the samurai. It's that's that's their close fighting weapon. This is what they really mm. what it comes down to when you're wrestling at point blank range. This is the thing that you're going to uh, take the other person's life with. So, and the reinforced point, obviously, within that period. Armour is a factor, so you might be, if you're using it actually in warfare, you might be trying to punch through um, riveted mail links in, in armpits or wherever else, penetrating through the garments which are underneath armour, so don't underestimate how tough they can be. Yeah. So if you've got layers of linen, um, maybe with some degree of padding in some parts, um, and you've got to punch through that, you need a point, a bodkin-like yeah. point that's going it, to do it, that. It is very resilient fabric mm. armour, mm. far more so than you'd imagine, because mm. you know you sit in bed and you look at your bed sheet and you think, well, great, you know, yeah, yeah. you stack thirty of those on top of each other. Yeah, yeah. especially if thing. they're slightly out of alignment, so that so that yeah, you know, and they're sewed together, not, so yeah. they're nice and dense, and yeah, yeah, it really becomes something stuff. else. I mean, there are accounts of, of of those stopping arrows as well, of you know yeah. the kind of layers of linen. Um, jacks, uh, for example, stopping arrows. Um, you know, additionally, also the rigidity of the blade, very, very important. Um, there are certain types of knife which are going to be lighter or sharper, potentially, but this is a pointy bar, and, and it has to be. It has to be really, really rigid, and you know, with this style of grip as well, to deliver a lot of force without flexing, without losing energy, without running the risk of breaking or bending. Um, and additionally, we know it, sometimes in, in the treatises that the second mm. hand is used t like a mini half sword, you know, as, using it as a lever. And so using a lever against bits of people's body or just simply to shorten the thing to, to <laughs> deliver more force. So it is, mm. you know, it, it is really, the rondel dagger really is a sharpened bar. Any edge it has is secondary to that. I yeah, think. well, I mean, some of the triangular ones, for instance, mm. and square ones, they mm. fundamentally don't have an edge. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. It's just not what they're for. And I think, you know, why do some of these have an edge? Well, potentially it assists with, uh, with penetration through certain types of fabric, but I think potentially also we know in uh, Pal one of Palace Cal, I think it could be Dastolaturn, it's called, um, it shows cutting of uh, straps or points on armour. So if you're in an armoured fighting and you're frantically trying to stab the person, um, if you manage to get something that can be cut in order to pull a piece, prize a piece of armour away to get the point in, then an edge is only advantageous at that point. Why not have an edge if you can, kind of thing, you know. Brilliant, right, shall we have a look at the next one? Yeah, well, the, we'll do the next next three together, but, um, well, three bullet daggers. And they, they show, to a certain extent, the, the start of the evolution of bullet daggers. So what I'd say is, these first two here... Um, so, so first of all, what is a bullet mm, dagger? Oh, okay, <laughs> well, first of all, go back. So what is a bullet dagger? Can I hold one of yeah, those yeah, up? Yeah, go for just it. So people. Um, so you were talking earlier on, actually, about a quill and dagger wasn't called a quill and dagger back in the day. Yeah. Well, there are very few references to bullet daggers in the literature. Um, one of the few, actually, is Chaucer, who mentions it. Really? Um, but they're not, they're not something you see on inventories all the time. I mean, I, I'm guessing it's just called a, a dagger. Yeah. I guess it is a medieval joke. You know, great, cock and balls. Why it's that shape, I don't know. It's it, not every day you hear Todd say that. <laughs> cock and balls. Oh, there you go, got it twice. <laughs> If you want a little guess, it is a, it's a peasanty knife. You want a guard, because that's always useful. Um, if you're going to have a guard in wood, it's got to be quite thick to be resilient. So you may as well thicken up the, the handle there. You've got to have something small enough that you can grip, and you end up with something, especially if you put a crease down the middle, cock and ball straight. <laughs> that would be my guess about how it evolved. It's just a kind of a logical form to make a wooden grip from. 
Same. I haven't, I haven't got any better explanation. No, exactly. Yeah, um, uh, uh, what they do appear quite suddenly, don't they? Pretty much in the in the fourteenth century. Um, they just... The earliest one I know is around about thirteen hundred from yeah. Scandinavia, and is is very similar to this one, in fact. Right. Um, so that was effectively what this one was based on. And these ones, actually, these two are uh, featured in the upcoming um, Outlaw King. Um, okay. So just tell us briefly about that. What's so um, uh, Outlaw King is about Robert the Bruce. Um, being pursued by the English across the Highlands and Lowlands of Scotland. Uh, I can't remember the exact date they've set it in. It's not necessarily historically the correct date. Okay. Around about 1300. Um, uh, and basically they wanted five bullet daggers for when he was down on his luck for him and his mates. Um, so they wanted these five bullet daggers. Kind of stretching the point slightly about bullet daggers being common then. Um, but it's almost historically correct <laughs> it is <laughs> which, almost historically which correct. by tv standards is, is actually good. yeah it's good um and and to be fair you know i'm not going to diss the thing i haven't seen it um it does look like it's going to be good entertainment so cool. that much i will say um one of my ancestors fought for robert the bruce so i'll get all patriotic about that now <laughs> um so this one is based on a dagger that is from around about 1300 and it's got these sort of like little arch cutouts just under mm. under the grip there so that one was kind of an easy, um, and then we needed four others. So I just tried to take elements of the time, um, or, or soon afterwards, um, to make them plausibly poor, plausibly for the, for the guys. Mm. Um, and I couldn't make five the same because that just doesn't work for a film, so they all had to be a little bit different. Um, so, so one of the things to say about bollock daggers is they they're often seen as the the kind of the lower class dagger, aren't they? So, the, so this is yeah. this is the upper class dagger. Or certainly, if we're talking fourteenth, fifteenth century, it goes different in the sixteenth century. But that's not always the case. Is no, it? it's not. There are some super high yeah. status versions of these. Well, the, this is this is where bollock dagger comes quite interesting because it starts uh, roughly with with one like this around about thirteen hundred. That's the earliest one I found. Um, it's very plain, very uninteresting. Um, always blunt backed mm. and because they're a working knife and as soon as you end up with a double sided knife mm. it restricts what you can do with it an awful lot mm. so um, they're always flat on the back in the early days then they start to, to develop guards through the 15th century the handle shape changes a little bit but you start to develop guards and they start to become double sided because they're now changing status and they're going from purely a working knife to now becoming uh, status knives as well. So you end up with, let's say, around 1460, bullet daggers which are incredibly fine. They're, they're mm. ultra jewellery, you know, mm. they're lovely, lovely things. Um, you often see them in portraiture as well, just to add to the joke. Uh, you know, you've got guys with, with the long skirts on their coats at the time. Yeah. And they wear the daggers here. So you yeah. see portraiture like that, you know, with... with the handle of the bollock dagger sticking out of the skirts of the I've always, I've always wondered a bit, um, do we assume what this is supposed to look like? Is it too obvious? And, and is it because I know that basilards were sometimes worn yeah. there as well, sometimes quite big basilards. Now, basilard doesn't look like anything like, no. well, it shouldn't anyway. If it does look like that, you <laughs> yeah. need to go and see your doctor right away. Yeah, and but, don't send a picture in. <laughs> but basilard is just an eye-shaped, yeah, yeah. you know, hilt, and they're worn in the same place. So maybe with our kind of, I don't know, modern kind of pervy minds, with, but it's difficult to see why else they would be shaped like this. Uh, is yeah. it a symbol? Uh, you know, we just don't know is the, is the answer, but mm. I've, I've wondered, is it a symbol of, is carrying a weapon a symbol of manhood? And is that, you know, so they did they did one person say, oh, I'm going to make a joke, I'm going to make my dagger, thing like that, and everyone went, oh, that's brilliant, I'm going to copy it. It's, <sighs> it's so really... Mind boggles me how it spread so quickly mm. and so suddenly, like as you say, around 1300, and then after that, for like half a 100, year, 150 years, th these were quite well, common. well they, they keep going because uh, we'll come back to that point in a minute. But, um, around about let's say 1490, 14, uh, 1500, they start to fall out of fashion again a little bit, mm. um, at least for the higher status. But then you okay. end up on things like the Mary Rose, yeah. so that's now you know, let's say they're, they're kitted out in the 1530s, 1540s. Mm. Those knives now, bullet daggers, are everywhere, but they seem to be lower status again. I mean, so the form has changed. Just yeah. to explain to anyone who doesn't know, so I talk about the Mary Rose a lot. It sank in 1545. A lot of the equipment that was on it, as you say, would have dated to the 1530s or earlier in the 40s. And there are a lot, aren't there? I mean, mm. I don't even know how many, maybe a hundred or, yeah, um, of uh, handles, because on the Mary Rose, it was a, a particular 
um, state of preservation on organic material. That's why the ship has survived. Yeah. So we've got all of, uh, not all, but we've got a lot of the organic material. So wood, bone, ivory, horn. all this kind mm. of stuff, horn, yeah. Uh, famously the long bows, um, also uh, shafts from bills. But the metal, by and large, with, some, with the exception of some cannons and large pieces, most of the metal disappeared. Yeah. So we've got hundreds of these um, bollock knife um, handles or hilts from the Mary Rose without blades, unfortunately. Yeah. I think there's some fragments. There, there are some blades, blades yeah. and there's some leather work, so you can tell yeah. blade shapes and so on. That's the amazing thing, yeah. Some scabbards survived, didn't yeah. they? Some sword scabbards mm. as well. But yeah, I mean, there's absolutely loads of them. And you're going to say, like, you know, they're, I mean, they're, we can tell quite a lot about how those were made. And you were saying uh, to me before that there's some differences in how. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at one like this, for instance, it's essentially it's round, it's been turned. Um, and you turn that as a round as well, you turn the balls as a round, and then you cut them off and you oh, carve in. Okay. Um, so on a lathe? On a lathe. Yeah. And, and you can see, you see the camera here, it tapers down. So this, originally, the guard bit is, is a big disc and then yeah. you cut the bits out. Yes. That's interesting. Um, whereas the Mary Rose ones, looking at them, um, it seems that they're not turned anymore, that they're, they're carved from a plank because the whole handle now is basically parallel and the same thickness as the balls, pretty much. Um, yes, I know. <laughs> um, and it looks like the whole thing's been carved. So the method of manufacture has changed, actually. Mm. But then, if you if you move, um, and again, I'll do a video uh, specifically about the evolution of the bullet daggers at a later date. But if you then move further beyond that, um, you get the, the dudgeon daggers of around about 1600, which mm. may or may not be the predecessor of the Scottish Dirk. Mm. But those again are quite similar, but an obvious evolution on from the Mary Rose hilts. I mean, I, I um, don't uh, personally. I don't think there's any question mm. that the Scottish Dirk does come from yeah. from from, from uh, bollock daggers because you can even see the the lines of, of the bollocks, as it were, yeah. either side of the guard. You know, so uh, yeah. I mean, I think absolutely it's, mm. a, it's a survival of it, and of course. You could say that the Dirk, the Highland Dirk, goes definitely into the 18th century and actually via kind of later, more ceremonial purpose ones into the 19th and even the 20th well, the century. Day, they really, still yeah. exist. Yeah. They're, still, they're still regimental, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. Um, and with later ones, the, the delineation of the, of, the, of the nuts, as it were, gets less obvious. But if you really look hard, you can see the nuts there. They are, they are there on the Dirk. Yeah. yeah, I wonder if anybody can think of any jokes to do with what we just talked about. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, let's let's wrap this one up. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah. So basically, um, so you've got a bunch of bollocks coming to your range, basically. Uh, they will be expanding shortly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what, no, what I am going to do because another really glaring, obvious hole in the market for me are dudgeon daggers. I don't know how many yeah. people out there want dudgeon daggers, but they're coming. Um, and Scottish dirks because the offerings, as far as I'm concerned, of early Scottish dirks, I don't. I personally don't like all the interlaced ones and they're too difficult to make at a good price. Mm -hmm. But the, the very early Scottish Dirks, again, the handles are all just so overblown and everything. So, mm -hmm. you know, that'll be coming online too. And, um, and a couple of Basilards I'm doing. Oh, so, really? Yeah, Brilliant. so a nice Swiss and a nice Italian Basilard. And that's all in the, in the Todd Cutler range? All in the Todd Cutler range. Brilliant. So they'll all be somewhere between 60 and 85 pounds. When are we hoping that they're going to appear then? Six weeks from now. Oh, so really? roughly speaking, let's just say... November 2018. Something like that. Brilliant. Okay, so by ready for Christmas, basically. Ready for Christmas, yeah. Right, Watch so basically, save up your money or ask your um, loved ones for a new dagger for Christmas. Obviously, I'll stick the link below to uh, Todd Cutler. This is a brilliant range of daggers because, you know, many of us have been uh, admiring Todd's work for many, many years, and this basically brings them into you know these ones makes them much more affordable for more people to be able to get their hands on and or to buy more of and get you know one of I mean I, you know it'd be it nice works. to have yeah it'd be nice to have multiples of these and they are really really nice I don't know anybody else making this quality of dagger in this price range at all lovely lovely things they're well historically researched uh, beautifully made um, so great stuff go and get your daggers basically and i look forward to seeing these new ones so really oh, i'm a big yeah. fan of basilards so yeah yeah no i've been looking for that for a while actually yeah. um i mean I remember my early days actually reenacting i mean you could not get basilards at all full stop nobody made them and they're a nuisance to make aren't they they're not they're yeah. not nice yeah. to make um 
and there's some on the market now which are not so great no, um no. So there's a lot of rubbish out there don't buy rubbish save up money yeah. buy good ones okay yeah. you won't regret it lovely <laughs> okay well, brilliant anyway, thank thanks todd and uh see you guys for the next video cheers folks see ya.